Good morning. Welcome to worship at First Presbyterian Church of Columbus, Georgia. We're glad that you're here to join us as we worship God by offering our prayers and singing songs and listening to scripture. Please come in with us that we may worship God together. Do not be afraid. I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for He has been raised. Alleluia. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed.
Please be seated. The proof of God's amazing love is this, that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. And because we have faith in Him, we can approach God with confidence so we may confess our sins before God. And why do we pray together? We are a community. If one of us suffers, we all suffer. If one of us rejoices, we all rejoice. Let us offer our prayers in unison. Almighty God, in raising Jesus from the grave, You shattered the power of sin and death. We confess that we remain captive to doubt and fear, bound by the ways that lead to death. We overlook the poor and the hungry and pass by those who mourn. We are deaf to the cries of the oppressed and indifferent to calls for peace. We despise the weak and abuse the earth you made. Forgive us, God of mercy. Help us to trust your power to change our lives and make us new, that we may know the joy of life abundant given in Jesus Christ, the risen Lord. Hear these words of Paul to the Galatians. We have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer we who live, but it is Christ who lives in us. And the life we now live in the flesh, we live by faith in the Son of God, who loved us and gave Himself up for us. Friends, hear and believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Please be seated. Greet everyone here today in the name of our risen Savior, Jesus Christ, and glad that you are here. We invite you to please sign the attendance pad at the end of your pew. Mark your address if you're a first-time guest, then back to its point of origin. And following a special treat we're going to do at the end of the worship service, be sure and extend that right hand of fellowship. During our postlude, we invite everyone to come forward down front, and we're going to have a photograph made of the group that's gathered here during the postlude. Picture will be taken from the balcony. Same thing will happen at 11 o'clock. Again, just as a way of celebrating all that are here today, a member, a guest, visitor, whatever. Uh, we invite you during the postlude to come forward uh, and to, um, for our photograph, it'll be taken from the balcony. Then following that, there is the Easter brunch through the doors and um, into the reception hall. It's been set out, a wonderful time to fellowship and see those who will be here for 11 o'clock uh, gives you a chance to visit. Uh, Easter egg hunt will also take place during that break. Today we receive our Easter offering. It uh, is divided between Thornwell we formerly took it in the fall. Now we take it in the spring. So this will be our Thornwell offering as well as um, for the Global Mission uh, offering. And uh, we also receive it next Sunday because people go, oh yeah, I forgot, bring it next Sunday. But again, the Easter offering goes for both purposes. Now I'm already looking really several weeks ahead, but May 7th will be Youth Sunday. And following that, at the 11 o'clock worship service, we'll be having a celebration luncheon in the fellowship hall. And if you're able to attend, please sign up for that. 
And again, I want to remind you, during the post to please come forward uh, for the group picture that will be taken at that time. As we come now to a time to proclaim God's Word, let us sing God of grace and God of glory. The words are in your bulletin. Our first lesson today comes from Jeremiah 31, beginning with the first verse, and listen now to the Word of God. At that time, says the Lord, I will be the God of all the families of Israel, and they shall be my people. And thus says the Lord, the people who survived the sword found grace in the wilderness when Israel sought for rest. The Lord appeared to him from far away, and I have loved you with an everlasting love, and therefore I have continued my faithfulness to you. Again I will build you, and you shall be built, O virgin Israel. Again you shall take your tambourines and go forth in the dance of the merrymakers. Again you shall plant vineyards on the mountains of Samaria. The planters shall plant and shall enjoy the fruit." For there shall be a day when the sentinels will call in the hill country of Ephraim, Come, let us go up to Zion, to the Lord our God. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
ask that you remain standing while I read the gospel reading. It is Matthew 28. If you so choose to follow along in the Pew Bible, it is on page 33 of the New Testament section. Let us listen that we may hear what God will share with us. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descending from heaven came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. For fear of him, the guard shook and became like dead men. But the angel stood to the women. Do not be afraid. I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has been raised. As he said, come see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, he has been raised from the dead, and indeed he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him. This is my message to you. So they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to tell the disciples. Suddenly, Jesus met them and said, greetings. And they came to him and took hold of his feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Hallelujah! Christ is risen. He says, risen indeed. Okay, let's practice that one. Hallelujah! Christ is risen. Amen. Um, so, you know, who are you going to tell? That's one question. What are you going to tell? That's another one. What are we going to tell people about this great event, and who are we going to tell about it? This Easter story is told four times in the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, each one of the gospel accounts, the, the tales of Jesus' life tell it. There's a little bit of variation in each one of them, but there's some basic facts. Jesus was dead. The body is not there in the tomb. He has been risen. That is the proclamation, and you are to tell other people about it. You have heard this story that was shared here today. You've probably heard it in other places as well. Maybe some of you have questions. Maybe some of you have doubts. Maybe there's just a so what attitude that we have from time to time. Maybe. The word tell is captivating. In the gospel, Jesus does a lot of telling. For example, in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, I tell you until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter of the law, one stroke from the letter will pass from this law until all is accomplished. He's telling us. When the centurion came to have his daughter healed in Matthew 8, Jesus says, truly I tell you, no one in Israel have I found such faith. I tell you, many will come from east and west and sit at table with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom while the heirs of the kingdom will be thrown into outer darkness. In Matthew 11, John, uh, Jesus says this about John the Baptist. What then did you see in this hymn? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and that, and more than a prophet. When we tell, we share. We have a story we want to get out there. We announce, we proclaim, we disclose, we give evidence as the phrase goes, tell it like it is. We tell things that are important to us. And Matthew's gospel gives us two tales that we are to tell about the resurrection. Which one do we choose? There is the tale of Mary Magdalene and the other Mary that they have to tell. They go to the tomb early on that first Easter morning. The stone is rolled away, the angel is there, and they are given a message don't be afraid. You're looking for Jesus. He's not here. He is risen. Come. You can see where he was. 
Now you go and you tell the others that they need to go to Galilee to get there quickly. That is the thing they need to do. That's one, one tale that there is to tell. There is another tale, and that is the tale that the guards tell. The religious officials who oversaw or, or created and instituted this um, event of the crucifixion, they feared that Jesus' talk about returning and resurrection and coming in three days, they feared that something would happen. And so they persuaded Pilate to place a guard, a set of guards, at the tomb. And that's who was there. They were looking over the uh, they were looking over the tomb to make sure there would be no mischief there, there. But then there is the earthquake that Matthew's gospel speaks of, and the stone is rolled away, and the body is not there, and the women are afraid. But did you notice what happened to the guards? The guards stood and became like dead men. That's what one translation says. The, another one says they were so frightened they could not move. The guards were there. They saw it too. They wondered. But what tale would they tell? If you continue reading on in Matthew after the selection this morning in verse 11, you do find out while they were going, some of the guards went to the city and they told the chief priest everything that had happened. And the priest assembled the elders and they devised a plan to give a large sum of money to the soldiers, telling them, you must say, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the guards took the money and did as they were directed. And this story is still told among the Jews to this day. It's a tale of conspiracy. We love conspiracies, don't we? It's a tale of conspiracy. Jesus' body was stolen by his disciples. The story, though, was created as a conspiracy. It was created and confirmed with a bribe. The religious authorities say, we will make sure you don't get in any trouble. Take the money and shut up. This tale of the guards is still around today. The Scripture tells us it's there from the very beginning. But every so often we we hear a new theory or an explanation of the resurrection. Jesus was drugged. He was really in a very deep sleep. He feigned death, something else, a variety of explanations. The presentation may be new, but the tale is very, very old. It's been there all along. So which tale do you want to tell? Which tale draws you to it and, and me to it? Which one is the one where we find hope and grace? Which one is the one we find that is compelling and transforming and life-giving? <clears throat> the Methodist Bishop Will, Bill, William Williman has said, there are so many ways to explain the resurrection. And along with his colleague, Chris, uh, Stanley Hauerwas, he has, <coughs> they have written this sentence that gets repeated by preachers almost every Easter, we cannot explain the resurrection. The resurrection explains us. We cannot explain the resurrection. The resurrection explains us. That is, we would not be here today in this place on this day if the resurrection had not happened. The story of body snatching is not sufficient and compelling enough to create a community of disciples that's going to last for 2,000 years. The history and the tales of the Christian community and the church for these 2,000 years have many wonderful and exemplary stories and, and, and episodes in it. But we have to acknowledge we also have some pretty bad places in our story as well. We have more often, we have, have oftentimes created church to be a contact sport, and we have thrown elbows, and we have received elbows, and we have hurt each other. Yet, 
we also know we are here because there is a story greater than any of the hurts that could have been inflicted among ourselves. And that is that God loved us in Jesus Christ and God sent Jesus to offer through death and resurrection a new way of living, a new life to tell. So which tale do you tell? The conspiracy theory or the tale of new life that there is? And to whom do you tell it? <coughs> to whom do you share it with? In biblical times and for much of human history, the testimony of women was not valued. In fact, it was not even accepted as legally permissible. Today, circumstances have changed a lot, but there remain places where women's voices are still not trusted as much as men's tales. Women who are attacked often find themselves being a victim a second time of critique. A man who may express vulnerability may be praised for his authenticity and integrity, but when a woman may share the same sort of experience, she will, may be criticized as being weak or tainted. You know that. I pray that as my granddaughter grows up, the world will change and necessary things will happen so that testimony, such testimony will be accepted and the testimony that my granddaughter has may be proclaimed and accepted. It is a strange then that God would entrust the witness of the resurrection to these women, it is almost as if saying there is a different way of living and sharing that. They received it, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, they received this message and they took it to the disciples. These disciples who included Peter, who had denied Jesus. Do you remember that? Peter had denied Jesus not once, not twice, but three times. He had, been, it, it, he had been pointed out as saying, you were one of them. And he said, no, no, I'm not. He denied Jesus three times, even as Jesus was being tried. The disciples, they all went to the garden with Jesus. <coughs> they all went to the garden. But they fell asleep. They could not wait with him, even in the, that most trying time. The disciples disappeared. They are not to be seen in Matthew, Mark, and Luke's account of the Gospels. They are not anywhere near the execution that is known as the crucifixion. Only in John's Gospel is one disciple there, along with a group of women. The disciples, those who had accompanied him, they had fled. They had gone AWOL. Yet, the risen Christ's message was to go and tell those folks to go to Galilee, where you will see me. The question is not only what are you going to tell, the question is who are you going to tell? Mary Magdalene and the other Mary are told to share that news and tell the disciples to go to Galilee, and they do. Galilee, it was the place that was very familiar. Andrew, Peter and Andrew, James and John, they had been fishermen and they had fished the waters of that large lake. The other disciples knew the streets. They had wandered the, the streets of Capernaum. They knew the cities that were around the, the hillsides of that place. And then it is in that place where the risen Lord, according to Matthew's version of it, the risen Lord goes and tells them and proclaims with them, as it is found in the message translation, the eleven disciples went on to Galilee. They went to the mountain that Jesus had set for the reunion. The moment they saw Him, they worshiped Him. <coughs> Some, though, 
held back, not sure about risking themselves totally. Jesus, though, was undeterred. He went right ahead and he gave them this charge. God authorized and commanded me to commission you. <coughs> Go out and train everyone you meet far and near in this way of marking them by baptism and in the threefold name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Then instruct them in the practice of all that I have commanded you, and I'll be with you on that day, day after day, after day, after day, right up to the end of the age. The presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church, Michael Curry, released a very interesting video last week, and he has a question in it. The question is, where is your Galilee? Where is your Galilee? Where is it that you are to go? And he said this, he said, is it, it is in Galilee that the risen Lord will be found and seen for he has gone ahead of us. Galilee is a way of talking about the world. <coughs> Galilee in the street of the city, Galilee in the rural communities, Galilee in the hospitals, Galilee in the office places, Galilee is where God's children live and dwell. There in Galilee, you will meet the living Christ. Curry continues by telling of a conversation that he had once with a Methodist pastor who had gone to a city to create a new church. His denomination had sent him there to create a city without walls among the street community. The Mennonite pastor told the Episcopal bishop that in our day and time, the church cannot wait for the community to come to it. The church must go where the people are. That's a big shift for a lot of us to think about. The church is not simply a place to come to, but the church is a place to go out into, to share that message that Christ gave in Galilee, to go out into the world. There are two messages here. First, to those of you who make church the fabric of your life, for those of, of us who show up whenever the door is opened, as the, as the saying goes. Thank you. Thank you for your faithfulness and for your perseverance. But like Mary and Magdalene and the other Mary were told, the task is to go and tell the others to go to that place of Galilee. A place can be an important touchstone. A place can be holy ground. But not all appreciate the places that we value as much as we would ourselves. One day they may. But today, but today on Easter Sunday, we are told to leave what we know and go to Galilee. The second message is for those of you who may consider yourselves to be on the fringes of Christian community. You may be in a personal or family transition. You may have questions, you may have doubts. Thank you for those. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for your doubts. Thank you for your uncertainty. Those make us all able to be stronger. Thank you for taking the time today to come and share. The part of the body that is First Presbyterian Church of Columbus is seeking to be faithful to its calling to go to Galilee. It's a work in progress, and I would invite all to come and try to make our way together, whether or not we are convinced of the centrality of a place or whether or not we know the direction and the power of being sent out, whether or not we have questions or whether or not we have certainties. We are bound together by this event of Easter. I know that these two groups that I have described may be thought of as distinct, but I also know that there's a lot of overlap between them. I know that there are people who are in the middle there, who have questions, who have uncertainties, and yet who also have conviction. And we all need each other for that purpose. I cannot tell you anyone here what the future holds, 
but I know the Easter story. The women went to the tomb. It was empty. They were given a message to go and share the resurrection power story and to tell the disciples to go to Galilee. The first army chaplain that I really got to know in a professional way was assigned to the 82nd Airborne in Fort Bragg, North Carolina. The church that I was serving at the time was located nearby, and we had supported his chaplaincy work. We had sent Bibles to him when he was in, uh, in, in uh, deployed in the Gulf War in the 1990s. We had had him come and speak and teach in our church. One day he and I were talking, and he made the comment that he was up to go and be, take part in jump qualification exercises. He had actually done it before, so this was a requalification, but it had come, his, his certification had expired, and he needed to go back, and the next week he would be jumping out of an airplane, and I made some sort of snarky comment like, why would anybody want to jump out of an airplane? You get it, I think. But then he said, well, yeah, it's important for me to do this because this is the world where my soldiers are. These are the guys that I minister to, and they need to know that I'm there for them all the time. Yeah, I get it. To use Bishop Curry's language, my chaplain friend was going to Galilee to jump out of an airplane to share his presence in Christ's presence with those who did the same. What are you going to tell? Are you going to tell the conspiracy theory that was concocted in bribery and fear? Or are you going to tell the tale of resurrection and new life? And to whom will you tell that tale? May we all go to our Galilees and share the wonder and the power of the story of resurrection and new life that Jesus Christ has shared with us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. Christ is indeed. Thanks be to God. I invite you to take the affirmation that you find in your bulletin of Col from Colossians and stand as we share that, and then remain standing for the singing of the Hallelujah Chorus. Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. In Him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible. All things have been created through Him and for Him. He Himself is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn of the dead, so that He might come to have first place in everything. For in Him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through Him God was pleased to reconcile all things, whether on earth or in heaven by making peace through the blood of the cross. Amen.
Please be seated. And let us pray. Almighty, gracious, and loving God, it is Easter, and we pray for Easter joy. We pray for those who even grieve on this happy day. Their grief is real, and we lift it up to your throne of grace. We pray for those who seek healing. We pray for protection from what steals our joy. We pray for Easter joy. And by the victory of Christ, we pray for Easter hope. Gathered today are some who wrestle with doubts and yet seek to believe. We pray for those seeking hope, reaching for the light through a dark cloud. We pray for those who hope to reconcile differences with spouses and family members and friends. We pray for Easter hope. By the power of the Holy Spirit, we pray for Easter vision. May we seek Your purpose for our lives, even if it means trying something new, and then may we follow it. May we discover Your direction for mission, and may we pursue it. And may we join Your will to challenge us to grow, and may we actively respond to that. We pray for Easter vision. We pray these things in the name of our risen, victorious Savior, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And let us continue our worship as we present to God our tithes, our offerings, our gifts, and our very selves.
gracious God, as we give our offerings to You today in the present, may we remember past blessings, and for those blessings we give You thanks. And may we courageously pray for our future hopes. In Jesus' name, amen. I would like to remind you and invite you during the postlude to come up for a, a church photograph. Uh, it'll be quick and painless, and then we can go on uh, about this. It'll be a wonderful way of, of uh, acknowledging and, and commemorating our time together. So, and the other side of that is you want to look just as good as the folks at 11 o'clock do too, right? So everybody needs to come up. Come up on the chancel, stand in front of the, uh, the lilies here so for this time. May may you this day, may you tell the tale of resurrection, the tale that Mary Magdalene and the other Mary shared with the disciples. May you go to your Galilee and share the news of the risen Christ. Thanks be to God. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, may that surround you and be with you as you breathe in and as you breathe out. May it accompany you with every step you take and every stride you make this day and always. Amen.
It's been a privilege to join you this day in worship. We're glad that you were here. First Presbyterian Church seeks to serve and minister in the name of Jesus Christ. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be kind and gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor. Go in peace as you love and serve God.